You have just walked into the spider's web. Careful not to tremble. This is a compilation of my three-part project documenting the life and lies of the infamous spymaster, Lord Varys. Making three videos, however, was not my original intent. The initial goal was to produce one video analyzing the epilogue of A Dance with Dragons, a deep dive into Varys' motives and mysteries. However, I realized to discuss Lord Varys, I would have to discuss Young Griff. To discuss Young Griff, I would have to discuss Illyrio, Sarah, and the Blackfire Theory. In no time at all, the theory grew in the telling. I divided the script into three parts to give each topic its due, each video its own unique thing with its own unique themes. However, they are all part of one long story, the life and lies of Lord Varys. So I've decided to combine them all into one video as intended to tell his grand story. Except that's not all. I have also included new content that can be found at the end of the video. Content where I delve into other theories related to Lord Varys and cover topics that couldn't make it into the original videos. The spider's web is immense, so I did my best to count every strand. With that being said, let's get into it. Chapter 1 Epilogue In the shocking conclusion to A Dance with Dragons, Lord Varys makes a triumphant return to the series, having gone missing for nearly two whole books. Through careful cunning, he lures Sir Kevin Lannister to Grand Maester Pycelle's chambers, where he mortally wounds the knight with a crossbow bolt to the chest. Helpless, Sir Kevin can do nothing but listen as Lord Varys tells him all about his grand plans for what sounds like Targaryen restoration. There are many questions to be had here. Where was Lord Varys? Who was Lord Varys? Why is Lord Varys? There are things about the spider that may chill your blood. But before we get to the theories, please do me the honor of liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and turning on notifications. And now, on with the video. Plump, perfumed, and powdered, Lord Varys is one of the series' most enigmatic characters. Unloved by the small folk and oft despised by the court, Lord Varys manages to buy his life one day at a time by being an invaluable source of information. The storms crash overhead, the big fish eats the little fish, yet Lord Varys keeps on paddling. The vast web of intrigue the spider has webbed over Westeros is intricate indeed. He has agents in almost all corners of the realm. There has not been a more infamous master of whisperers since Brendan Bloodraven Rivers, who watched over Westeros with a thousand eyes and one. The Iron Throne may belong to the King, but the Red Keep belongs to the Spider. Maegor the Cruel once said, only the blood of the dragon would ever know the secrets of the Red Keep, yet Lord Varys has somehow uncovered many of its deeper mysteries. We know very little of the Spy Master's past. It's said around court that Varys grew up in Lys as a slave. At one point in his youth, he became part of a mummer's troop. He traveled with his troop for some time until there came a day when a mysterious man offered to buy Varys from his master. The master mummer accepted the rather generous offer, unaware and uncaring of what it meant for his pupil. Varys was taken to a private room where he was paralyzed and then castrated. His private parts were burned in a brazier as part of a magical ritual. Varys claims to have heard the mysterious man speak to a voice, a voice within the flames. The memory of the disembodied voice haunts him even now. Varys has carried a deep hatred of magic ever since. After that dark and disturbing night, Varys was dismissed by the mysterious man to go die in what way seemed best to him. Rather than die, Varys resolved that he would live. He wandered through free cities, gaining a notorious reputation as a thief and a eunuch. Eventually, he crossed paths with a young swordsman named Illyrio Mopatis. The two conspired to create a vast criminal empire. But instead of stealing silver, they stole secrets. Using children that Varys called mice, the precursors to his little birds, Varys and Illyrio purloined the letters and ledgers of the rich and powerful in the city. What secrets Varys and his mice acquired, Illyrio offered to recover for those willing to pay the right price. They quickly rose to prominence within Pentos. Their activities would soon gain the attention of a mad king from across the narrow sea. Varys was summoned to King's Landing to serve on that king's council. His infamy only grew from there. It's nigh on impossible to verify all the details of this story, most of which we learn through second and third hand sources. It is known that Varys often tells half truths and whole lies, but the claim about Varys being a mummer appears to be true. He possesses the uncanny ability to transform himself into a variety of disguises. 
His costumes can be so convincing that people that are familiar with him would fail to recognize him even up close. In addition to his flowing robes and perfumes, Varys is known for his shaved head. This style of cut is called a mummer's cut in Bravos, as we find out in Book 5 when Arya has her head shaved by the Faceless Men. Quote, the Waif had shaved her head from when they took her eyes. A mummer's cut, she called it, since many mummers did the same so their wigs might fit them better. The word mummer is an archaic way of saying actor. Varys certainly has a flair for the dramatic, from his eccentric appearance to his choice of flowery scents to his sly, obsequious manner. So much of what he does is exaggerated for the purpose of theater, as if he were constantly putting on a show. Take for example the night Tyrion had Jano Slint exiled. Varys and Tyrion share a cup of wine following the event. Quote, Varys filled the cup. Ah, oh, sweet as summer. He took another sip. I hear the grapes singing on my tongue. It was my sister. That was what the old so loyal Lord Janos refused to say. Cersei sent the gold cloaks to that brothel. Varys tittered nervously. You left that part out, Tyrion said accusingly. Your own sweet sister, Varys said, so grief-stricken he looked close to tears. It is a hard thing to tell a man, my lord. I was fearful how you might take it. Can you forgive me? Here we have a shining example of how Lord Varys leads out important details in his reports as best fits his needs. And with a look of grief and with eyes brimming with tears, we see how quickly he can put on a melodramatic performance. One of his greatest performances might be on the night he killed Sir Kevin, a performance the fandom has been raving about ever since it was published over a decade ago. After incapacitating the Elder Knight, Varys tells him that Aegon, son of Rhaegar, is still alive. Sir Kevin insists Aegon is dead. He saw the infant's corpse himself, wrapped up in a crimson cloak. Varys resolutely disagrees. Quote, no. The eunuch's voice seemed deeper. He is here. Aegon has been shaped for rule since before he could walk. He has been trained in arms as befit a knight to be, but that was not the end of his education. Tommen has been taught that kingship is his right. Aegon knows that kingship is his duty, that a king must put his people first and live and rule for them. Other than a small cameo in A Feast for Crows, the epilogue in A Dance with the Dragons is the first time readers have seen Lord Varys in over a decade. A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one for those that missed the mincing eunuch. But could Lord Varys possibly be telling the truth, or is he lying? Is this conversation key to determining whether or not young Griff is who he claims to be? Those are not the questions you should be asking yourself. The most important question is, why would Lord Varys talk to Sir Kevin at all? There was no reason for Lord Varys to reveal himself, no reason for a confession of truth or lies. Since Varys shot Kevin from afar, he could have slid into the shadows without being noticed on soft, slippered feet. Yet he decided to confront Sir Kevin and force a conversation. It is not a kindness, nor it is a courtesy for Varys to explain his endgame to a dying man, a man whose murder he will be responsible for. What's worse is that Varys goes into excruciating detail about how he will destabilize Lannister rule to pave the way for his Targaryen pretender. Which means Sir Kevin goes to his grave knowing his family is in terrible danger. Not a comforting last thought. If Varys truly felt sorry for his actions, a quicker method would have been preferable, and no long self-indulgent speech. But the former mummer wanted this moment to last. He couldn't resist putting on a show, especially for such a captive audience. You see, Varys doesn't want to comfort Sir Kevin in his final moments. He wants to torture him, and he wants to savor every sweet second until the end. Varys may present himself as someone who is soft and sensitive, a threat to no one, all he wants is what's best for the realm, but in reality, he is cold, calculating, and callous, wholly indifferent to the suffering of others. That is because Lord Varys is one of this story's major villains. He has escaped detection by hiding his true nature under brocade robes, heavy perfumes, and a slimy smile. To quote from a Terry Pratchett novel, if a man has you entirely at his mercy, then hope like hell that man is an evil man. Because the evil like power, power over people, and they want to see you in fear. They want you to know you're going to die. So they'll talk, they'll gloat, they'll watch you squirm. They'll put off the moment of murder like another man will put off a good cigar. So hope like hell your captor is an evil man. A good man will kill you with hardly a word. Lord Varys was monologuing the night he killed Sir Kevin. He was committing the trope of evil gloating. Evil gloating is when the villain reveals their grand plan to a helpless victim, usually the hero, the role Sir Kevin was forced to play the night he was murdered. Lord Varys says that Sir Kevin was stabilizing Tommen's rule, which would have brought the realm to peace. This would have made Sir Kevin a hero, at least in the eyes of House Lannister. Sir Kevin's death was basically scripted, right down to the props being used. Quote, Sir Kevin tried to rise, but the strength had left him. He could not feel his legs. I thought the crossbow fitting. 
You shared so much with Lord Tywin. Why not that? Bringing up Sir Kevin's recently deceased brother is not comforting. Again, it is just cruel. And cruelty is the point. There was no need for the crossbow. Cersei would have blamed Sir Kevin's murder on Tyrion regardless of how he died. The crossbow was for Varys' own amusement. Dramatic irony that someone who likes theater could appreciate. Nothing more. The whole event was a mummer's farce, one that's part of a grand show Varys has been putting on for decades. Varys may be a player in the Game of Thrones, but he does not view the game like a round of scythe ass as other people do. Varys views it all as a stage show. Quote, When I was a young boy before I was cut, I traveled with a troop of mummers through the free cities. They taught me that each man has a role to play, in life as well as mummery. So it is at court. The king's justice must be fearsome, the master of coin must be frugal, the lord commander of the king's guard must be valiant, and the master of whisperers must be sly and obsequious and without scruple. A courageous informer would be as useless as a cowardly knight. Throughout his time at King's Landing, Varys has been performing a variety of carefully crafted roles. In some scenes, he is Lord Varys, the Master of Whisperers, the Spider. Other times, he is Rugen, the rough-voiced jailer that reeks of sour wine. In some cases, he's a begging brother. In others, a cloaked hooded figure with voluminous sleeves. He's even portrayed the role of a matronly woman. Varys is who the scene requires. Varys determined Pycelle and Sir Kevin no longer fit the narrative he had designed, so their characters had to be cut. Sir Kevin was a competent and capable leader. If the Lannisters had to fall, killing him makes sense. But why Pycelle? Pycelle may have been a Lannister lackey, but even he was incapable of course correcting the Mad Queen's rule. Leaving him on Cersei's council would perhaps quicken her inevitable demise. Could it be then that Pycelle had compromising information on Lord Varys? Quote, Do all maesters lie so poorly? I told no one that I had offered Marcella to the Dornish. That truth was only in the letter I entrusted to you. Pycelle clutched for a corner of the blanket. Birds are lost, messages are stolen or sold. It was Varys. There are things that I might tell you of the eunuch that would chill your blood. Was Pycelle merely prejudiced of Varys for being a foreign born eunuch or did he know some dark secret? It has also been theorized that as Grand Maester, Pycelle would have been present for the birth of Prince Aegon. He may be aware of a birthmark or other identifying feature that would help determine whether or not young Griff is who he claims to be. It is more likely that Varys killed Pycelle to open a post on the small council for a new Grand Maester, one that is not overly loyal to a specific house. Varys is casting his new show accordingly and he needs just the right person for each and every role. As for Aegon's anatomy, if Pycelle were to suggest that he knew of an identifying birthmark, his claims will be dismissed as nothing more than Lannister lies. And it would be odd to mention now, six books into the story, that Aegon has a birthmark when no such mark was ever mentioned before. Varys himself claims he is not allied to one particular house over the other. In the Black Cells, Eddard Stark once asked the eunuch where he placed his allegiance, and Varys said this, quote, Tell me, Lord Varys, who do you truly serve? Varys smiled thinly. Why? The realm, my good lord. How could you ever doubt that? I swear it by my lost manhood. I serve the realm, and the realm needs peace. This is not a half truth, but a whole lie. Varys's machinations don't steer the realm towards peace. Varys is working towards war. Young Griff's ascension to the Iron Throne would not be a peaceful one. No one coming to remove the reigning monarch from the Iron Throne can expect to do so in a peaceful manner. Such a contest means war. Already lives are being lost as the Golden Company makes their incursion along the Westerosi coast. This invasion will lead to war, and as Varys himself has said, it will be the innocents that suffer the most as their High Lords play their Game of Thrones. Varys does not care about the innocents no more than he does for his little birds. During their secret conversation beneath the Red Keep in Book 1, Varys requested that Illyrio send him more little birds. He begged Illyrio to treat them gentle, yet he has their tongues torn out all the same. It seems that since he was cut when he was younger, he has no problem taking orphaned children and having them mutilated as well. In some cases, when people were abused in their youth, they grow up and commit the same sort of crimes that were perpetrated upon them. So Varys' claim of wanting peace is just one of the multitude of lies he has told throughout his lifetime. Something Ned noticed before his fall from grace. Quote, Varys was worse. For all his protestations of loyalty, the eunuch knew too much 
and did too little. The only reason Varys wants peace is because he doesn't want war to happen so soon. Westeros must be destabilized at just the right time to ensure a swift victory of Young Griff's invasion. So all his talk of trying to save King Robert from Lannister intrigue and of trying to save Ned was all an act. During their dungeon conversation, Varys seems to quite enjoy describing how Ned's poor choices led to his current imprisonment and how Ned's children, in particular Sansa, are in grave danger. Down here in the dark, Varys is no longer shy and squeamish of graphic details. There are no exclamations of, oh, how dreadful, or false tears when horrors are spoken of. No, in that black pit, Varys has no problem describing how Sansa could be decapitated and her head brought to Ned if he doesn't cooperate with the Queen. Understanding all of this is important in deciphering part of what happened the night Varys killed Sir Kevin. People have wondered who Varys might have truly been talking to on that night. Was he actually remorseful for having to kill the aged knight and felt it necessary to explain his actions? Was he perhaps speaking out loud so that his little birds may overhear? Or did he think that someone else may have been within earshot? The truth is Varys was speaking for his own benefit. He was glorying in his own triumph. For for decades, Varys has been building towards his endgame. He has had to keep his actions a secret this whole time, along with keeping up this false persona. The only person he has let in on the plan is Illyrio, who lives far away in Pentos. He has no one to confide in. But now, with victory seemingly so close at hand, Varys has allowed himself this one moment to indulge, one moment to take the mask off. And why not? It's not as if his little birds will ever betray him and the only person within earshot is about to die. Remember the conversation between Littlefinger and Sansa in the Feast for Crows, where he warned her that they must keep up their deceptions even behind closed doors. Quote, Littlefinger put a finger to her lips. I know what I know and so do you. Some things are best left unsaid sweetling. Even when we are alone? Especially when we are alone. Elsewise, a day will come when a servant walks into a room unannounced, or a guardsman at the door chances to hear something he should not. Do you want more blood on your pretty little hands, my darling? Littlefinger is right in that it is best to keep your guard up at all times, especially when you dare to roll the dice in the Game of Thrones. But Littlefinger is guilty of doing the same thing Varys is doing with Sir Kevin, except his audience is Sansa Stark. Through all the years of scheming and plotting, Littlefinger, like Varys, has had no one to confide in until now. Sansa makes for a captive audience, quite literally in this case. Littlefinger captured her from the Lannisters and now holds her in the Eyrie. She is also easily impressed and intrigued by the secrets Littlefinger shares with her. Littlefinger loves that he has someone who looks so much like Catelyn but is much more tractable. Littlefinger is a simpleton for Sansa and this may lead to his undoing. Because unlike the case with Sir Kevin and Varys, Sansa, or Elaine rather, is still alive and that little bird holds many secrets and one day she might start singing. Varys and Littlefinger are the kind of criminals that don't want to get caught but who can't pass up a golden opportunity to explain just how clever they are. However, there still remains the question, was Varys telling the truth or not? Is the boy called Aegon truly Aegon? It is said that power reveals. And what did Lord Varys reveal when he held supreme power over Sir Kevin? He revealed that he was capable of tormenting a man in his final moments. That he could use mute children to finish the dark deed. Varys monologued like a Bond villain. Incredible, I know. The syndromes of classic villains can include monologuing, torture, a secret lair, and the use of henchmen, the types of villains Martin grew up reading in comic books and pulp novels. While this series is known for breaking tropes, sometimes you have to bring out the classics every now and again. They'll hit their mark every time. If you had any respect for Varys, after this, you lose it. That respect might be replaced with a healthy dose of fear. But this isn't the first moment Varys induces a bit of fear. There's a passage in A Storm of Swords that reads differently now that we know Varys is capable of committing such horrors. Quote, Varys, you are as cold and slimy as a slug. Has anyone ever told you? You did your best to kill me. Perhaps I ought to return the fever. The eunuch sighed. The faithful dog is kicked, and no matter how the spider weaves, he is never loved. But if you slay me here, I fear of you, my lord. You may never find your way back to daylight. His eyes glittered in the shifting torchlight, dark and wet. These tunnels are full of traps for the unwary. 
Tyrion completely misses the thinly veiled threat. He takes Varys so lightly he thinks he could kill him. Varys implies there are traps Tyrion would not survive without him, but as we now know, if Tyrion did attempt to kill him, Varys would be the winner in that fight. He is a cold-blooded killer. And of course, he must be. Think about his life growing up in the Free Cities, a continuous fight for survival. We can be sure he's killed before, and he'll probably kill again. Chapter 2 The Mummer's Dragon now that we've discussed the selfish and sadistic reasons why Varys made this dramatic confession, we must now determine if there's any truth to what was said. Is the boy called Young Griff truly Aegon, son of Rhaegar? Or is he a feigned boy who bears a dragon's name? Young Griff is a character introduced in A Dance with the Dragons. Tyrion Lannister is the first of the surviving POV characters to meet him when he is sent by Varys to Pentos to escape execution. He finds the young lad living upon the River Rhoyne in a single masted polebolt called the Shy Maid. Young Griff is accompanied by an interesting cast of misfit characters. Among them are the married couple Ysilla and Yandri. Then there are the Westerosi exiles, Sir Rowley Duckfield, Halden Halfmaester, the Septa Lamour, and a man named Griff. The Tyrion is told that Griff is the father of Young Griff. Father and son dye their hair blue to pay respects to Young Griff's deceased Tyroshi mother. Colorful hairstyles are a Tyroshi custom. After observing the day-to-day -day activities aboard the Shy Maid, Tyrion begins to suspect that this unlikely lad may be more than what he claims to be. Young Griff is trained in combat by Sir Rowley Duckfield, a newly made knight. He is instructed in the ways of the faith by the Septa Lamour. He is taught a lot of scholarly topics by Halden Halfmaester, a very curious curriculum for a sellsword son, something Tyrion points out to Halden right before a game of Syvas. Quote, the boy is bright. You've done well by him. Half the lords in Westeros are not so learned, sad to say. A wager is made over the outcome of the game. Instead of playing for coin, Tyrion and Halden will trade secrets. In the end, Tyrion wins, and in turn, he is given the truth of what is really going on aboard the Shied Maid. The boy called Young Griff is not the son of Griff, nor is that even his name. His real name is Aegon, and he claims to be the son of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. It is believed by all that the infant Prince Aegon was killed during the sack of King's Landing. Sir Gregor Clegane confessed during Tyrion's trial by combat to murdering the infant and his young mother. The man said to be his father is really John Connington, the former Lord of Griffin's Roost and the once and future Hand of the King. Mad King Aerys had Connington exiled after his failure to capture Robert Baratheon during the Battle of the Bells. Connington fled to Essos where he joined the Golden Company, but was dismissed from their service after being caught stealing from the company's coffers. Now twice exiled, the last anyone heard of Connington is that he died a destitute drunkard. It should come as no surprise that this was all an elaborate story cooked up by Lord Varys to keep the perfect princeling and his protector safe. This so-called Aegon, like Viserys and Daenerys, has spent the years waiting for the opportunity to take back the Targaryen ancestral seat. The boy's claims are most certainly possible. It would not be the first time in Targaryen history that a spymaster saved Targaryen heirs by sneaking them out of the castle through one of its many hidden passages. Laris Strong took Aegon II and his heirs to safety by similar means. Varys himself hastened Tyrion away through those same hidden passageways. Megor the Cruel had the castle designed for this very purpose. So there is hope then that one of Rhaegar's heirs with Ilya Martell has survived and that the tragedy that took place the night the Lannisters sacked King's Landing has something of a bittersweet ending. Yet when you consider the source of the story, the deceitful and duplicitous Lord Varys, the master of whisperers, the spider, then the tale becomes a potion too bitter to swallow. How can we trust a man who lies as easily as most people breathe? How can we trust a man who claims to want peace for the realm yet has consistently pushed for war? When it comes to the idea that Aegon, son of Rhaegar and Ilya of Dorne, has survived, I must confess that I have doubts. I have such doubts. Lord Varys simply isn't trustworthy enough. When dealing with the spider, you must also maintain some level of suspicion. There of course is no concrete evidence that confirms whether or not Young Griff is who he claims to be, but there may be clues. And all the clues I've compiled seem to indicate we have an imposter on our hands. First, let's explore the lies in Arbor Gold theory. This is the theory that states whenever the wine known as Arbor Gold is mentioned, someone may be lying. That some sort of deception is being made. 
This was first noticed in A Feast for Crows, to quote Peter Baelish from a Sansa chapter when they are discussing the truculent Lord Nestor Royce, We shall serve him lies in arbor gold, and he will drink them down and ask for more, I promise you. He is serving me lies as well, Sansa realized. They were comforting lies though, and she thought them kindly meant. A lie is not so bad if kindly meant, if only she believed them. Later, much later, after the flagon of arbor gold was dry, Lord Nestor Royce took his leave to rejoin his company of knights. Sansa was asleep on her feet by then, wanting only to crawl off to her bed, but Peter caught her by the wrist. You see the wonders that can be worked with lies and arbor gold? Cersei Lannister thinks of or requests arbor gold during her talks with her newly appointed council and several scenes throughout A Feast for Crows. We know she lies quite often, those who serve her lie often as well some of whom hold ulterior motives so they cannot be trusted. Young Griff claims that Varys exchanged him with another infant for a jug of Arbor Gold. The infant's father had a taste for wine, but he had yet to taste Arbor Gold. So when Varys made the offer, he found it too tempting to pass up. The man was said to be from a slum called Pisswater Bend. By saying the man and his son lived in a slum, it makes it easy to believe that such a destitute figure would sell their own flesh and blood for an expensive wine. However, it is the mention of Arbor Gold that leads me to believe that this exchange of infants simply did not happen. And if the exchange of infants did not happen, then it grieves me to say that Aegon Targaryen did not survive. He was murdered on the same night as his sister and his mother. This young griff is a fake dragon. Let us return to A Clash of Kings, there we will find a Targaryen whose blood no man can question. Daenerys Stormborn In Clash, Daenerys visits the House of the Undying, where she has a series of prophetic visions. We've talked about her visions in the past, and we will again in the future. But for the present, we will focus on one of them, the vision of a cloth dragon swaying on poles amidst a cheering crowd. Jorah and Danny discuss the vision after she leaves the ruins of the House of the Undying, Quote, a dead man in the prow of her ship? A blue rose? A banquet of blood? What does any of it mean, Khaleesi? A mama's dragon, you said. What is a mama's dragon, pray? A cloth dragon on poles, Danny explained. Mummers use them in their follies to give the hero something to fight. One definition of folly is, quote, a light theatrical entertainment consisting of a series of short sketches, songs, and dances. Folly was also a common allegorical figure in medieval morality plays. In those dramas, the character of folly tempts the protagonist into committing some sort of foolish action. This fits with what Daenerys had to say about cloth dragons being targets for the heroes in the shows that mummers put on. Varys was once a mummer, so if this boy called Aegon is a player in the show Varys has been designing, then he can be considered a mummer's dragon. Twice Daenerys has been forewarned of a mummer's dragon, once by the Undying and then again by Quaithe the Shadowbinder. Quaithe who came to Daenerys in a dream to warn her of her many approaching enemies. Kraken and Dark Flame, Lion and Griffin, the Sun's Son and the Mummer's Dragon. Daenerys must trust none of them. I know Quaithe is regarded with a lot of suspicion, but when she first met Daenerys, she offered her one thing. The truth. She was the only person who wanted to give something to Daenerys and not to take something from her. The truth is what she had to offer, truth that could be found in A Shy by the Shadow. And as I've said before, one of the themes in this series is the truth versus lies. Tyrion Lannister is told by yet another magic user, the Red Priest Mokoro, that false dragons will be appearing sometime in the future. Quote, Someone told me that the night is dark and full of terrors. What do you see in those flames? Dragons, Makoro said in the common tongue of Westeros. Dragons old and young, true and false, bright and dark, and you, a small man with a big shadow, snarling in the midst of it all. Daenerys is without a doubt the true-born daughter of Rhaella and Aerys Targaryen. Maester Aemon was the true-born son of Maegar Targaryen and his wife Diana Dane. Bloodraven might exist in a very tortured, broken form, but even still, he was a legitimized bastard of Aegon the Unworthy and Melissa Blackwood. Jon Snow is more than likely the trueborn son of Rhaegar and Lyanna Stark. There is precedent for Targaryen kings to take more than one bride. Even long after their dragons were dead, Daemon Blackfire almost took two brides for himself, but he was denied by his kingly brother. If Rhaegar and Lyanna had wed, then Jon would be a trueborn dragon. 
However, Jon Snow is not claiming to be a Targaryen, at least not yet, so we cannot consider him as a false dragon. If anything, Jon feels he is a false Stark, as the Kings of Winter tell him when he walks through Winterfell's crypts in his nightmares. For all Jon knows, he is the bastard son of Ned Stark and some unknown woman, but Jon Snow knows nothing. So of all the surviving dragons featured in the story, Young Griff stands out as the only candidate that could potentially be a false dragon. With all of these visions, we were warned about Young Griff's arrival long before he appeared on the page. Now that the character is finally here, the first point of view character to meet him is Tyrion Lannister, a man who has served false monarchs before. Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen were bastards born of incest, treason, and adultery. Tyrion still maintained the lie that they were trueborn Baratheons all the same. There are many great privileges when you are related to the Blood Royal. All of those benefits would have disappeared if Tyrion did not help his sister and her brood to keep their crowns. No doubt that's one of the reasons why Varys sent Tyrion to Pentos to be part of his plan rather than send him anywhere else in the world. Tyrion is highly intelligent and highborn which makes him a great asset, yet he is also shrewd and suspicious. He has already entertained thoughts that young Griff is not Aegon Targaryen. During a round of Scythe's, Tyrion provokes the prince into an outburst of anger and then thinks to himself this, quote, I lied, trust no one, and keep your dragon close. Young Griff jerked to his feet and kicked over the board. Scythe's pieces flew in all directions, bouncing and rolling across the deck of the Shy Maid. Pick those up, the boy commanded. He may well be a Targaryen after all. Varys would be aware that Tyrion would have doubts once he learned all about what's going on aboard the Shy Maid. Varys would also be aware that Tyrion is in no position to rock the boat. If Tyrion wants to return to Westeros and to claim his title of Lord of Casterly Rock, then his best bet is to keep his doubts to himself and to support a monarch who can pardon him for his crimes, even if that monarch is a fraud. As we all well know, A Song of Ice and Fire is inspired by real history, and in real history, many reigning monarchs have had their rule contested by false claimants. In the aftermath of the English Civil War known as the War of the Roses, two people attempted to claim the crown by pretending to be long-lost royals. There was Lambert Simnel, who claimed to be Edward Plantagenet, and then Perkin Warbeck, who claimed to be Prince Richard, one of the two missing princes in the tower. The Tsar, who would come to be known as Ivan the Terrible, sent his youngest son, Dmitri, and the child's mother to live in the city of Uglik. There, the young Tsarevich died under mysterious circumstances. In the years to come, three men would lead rebellions claiming to be Dimitri. Each one would be known as the False Dimitri. There were three or perhaps even four attempts by these False Dimitris to claim rule over Russia. These repeated rebellions bring to mind the many Blackfire rebellions in Westeros. But I believe the title of False Dragon comes from another high fantasy series. In Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series, there is a legendary character known as the Dragon Reborn. Many have been waiting for this legendary figure to return so that the dragon can face and defeat the Dark One. There have been several times throughout history when men would claim to be the Dragon Reborn. These pretenders are all known as false dragons. We find out later in the series that it is the earnest, hardworking teenager, the one with mysterious parentage, who is actually the true Dragon Reborn. And in A Song of Ice and Fire, we have a false dragon being paraded around, while the true dragon waits to be revealed. The earnest, hardworking teenager with mysterious parentage who may or may not be Azor Ahai Reborn. As of A Dance with Dragons, the realm is decaying under more and more lies. Jane Poole pretends to be Arya Stark in the North, the man holding her hostage, the bastard Ramsay Snow, and his father, along with the phrase, spread falsehoods about what truly happened at the Red Wedding, and even more lies about how Winterfell was taken. A godless man sits the sea stone chair, a kinslayer with blue lips, a false Baratheon sits the Iron Throne, a child born of incest, treason, and adultery. Now the Golden Company leads the charge to support a false Targaryen king. All this and more, and now winter is finally here. Such folly, such black mad folly. But relief may come soon. In the House of the Undying, Daenerys was called Bride of Fire and Slayer of Lies. The stage is being set for the Dance of the Dragons Part 2. Make no mistake, Daenerys and Young Griff will clash. Now you might be thinking, how can this be the next Dance of the Dragons if I just spent several minutes explaining why I think Young Griff is not a Targaryen? You must remember, black or red, a dragon is still a dragon. Young Griff's identity is hotly debated within the fandom. It is possible baby Aegon could have survived, but not probable. 
A false dragon ascending to the throne represents a deeper decay in the realm, and it fits more in line with the story's themes. It is Lord Varys who speaks of this degradation in the first book in an Eddard chapter. Quote, Sir Maeston loves his honor, Grand Maester Pycelle loves his office, and Littlefinger loves Littlefinger. The King's Guard, a paper shield, the eunuch said. Try not to look so shocked, Lord Stark. Jaime Lannister is himself a sworn brother of the White Swords, and we all know what his oath is worth. The days when men like Ryan Redwine and Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight wore the White Cloak are gone to dust and song. Of these seven, only Sir Barristan Selmy is made of the true steel, and Selmy is old. Sir Boris and Sir Merrin are the Queen's creatures to the bone, and I have deep suspicions of the others. This is just another example of Varys's hypocrisy. He has acknowledged that the court at King's Landing is no longer what it once was, but because of his secret quest of revenge, it will only get worse. Chapter 3 The Blackfire Theory we are in Lord Varys' endgame now. There is a moment in Clash where a private conversation between Tyrion and Lord Varys takes a dark turn. It is a subtle moment where Tyrion's tongue almost gets him into more trouble than he knows. The conversation takes place on the night Janos Slit was arrested and shipped off to the Wall with the doomed Alardine. As the two small council members discuss the night's events and ponder Varys' riddle about the perception of power, their talk veers into strange, uncharted territory. Quote, People have called me a half-man too, yet I think the gods have been kinder to me. I am small, my legs are twisted, and women do not look upon me with any great yearning, yet I'm still a man. Shea is not the first to grace my bed, and one day I may take a wife and sire a son. If the gods are good, he'll look like his uncle and think like his father. You have no such hope to sustain you. Dwarves are a jape of the gods, but men make eunuchs. Who cut you, Varys? When and why? Who are you, truly? The eunuch's smile never flickered, but his eyes glittered with something that was not laughter. You are kind to ask, my lord, but my tale is long and sad, and we have treasons to discuss. Tyrion's tactless question cuts deep, deeper than he could have possibly imagined. That glitter in Varys' eye was an emotion we have yet to see the amiable spymaster express. That was the glint of anger. While Varys is no stranger to being mocked for his status as a eunuch, Tyrion unknowingly seized on a point that is often overlooked when people insult Varys for his lack of a manhood. The fact that he cannot produce a child of his own. To a highborn, especially someone like Tyrion, who is a lion of Casterly Rock, Lord Varys not being able to have children would be of no significance. Varys was a former slave that managed to scheme his way up from the streets of Pentos to a place in Westerosi high society. If he died without passing on his name, well, no great loss. North or south, they sing no songs for spiders. Tyrion, like so many others, has not considered the possibility that Varys might actually have a name, a noble name, one that he is proud of. Varys goes by many names in different disguises, but if we look underneath the perfumes and powders, we may find his true identity. Remember that Varys claims he traveled as an orphan through the free cities where he learned mummery. He lived in the company of a Barossi swordsman, and then turned a career of stealing letters into a criminal empire with agents called Mice. This is very reminiscent of Arya Stark's journey throughout the series so far. Both Arya and Varys were orphaned. Both characters have had protection from Bravosi swordsmen, both trained as mummers to better hide their identities and their acting skills. Varys trained little mice to steal secrets. Arya was a little mouse that stole secrets while in Harrenhal. Quote, on the road, Arya had felt like a sheep, but Harrenhal turned her into a mouse. She was a gray mouse in her scratchy wool shift, and, like a mouse, she kept to the crannies and crevices and dark holes of the castle, scurrying out of the way of the mighty. This parallel could very well mean that Varys is of noble birth, just like Arya. It may be that his family was brought low by the royal family like the Lannisters did to the Starks. The Targaryens would still hold the throne at the time Varys was Arya's age. You can be sure that House Targaryen has driven many houses into extinction during his 300-year reign. But of all House Targaryen's troublesome vassals, 
there was only one house that dared to challenge their right for the Iron Throne, the renegade house Blackfire. House Blackfire was a cadet branch of House Targaryen formed over 100 years ago by a bastard son of Aegon the Unworthy and Queen Daena Targaryen. His name was Daemon, and he took the surname Blackfire after his father gifted him the Targaryen ancestral sword of the same name. King Daron, Daemon's trueborn brother, was distrusted by many members of his court. This was in part due to Aegon the Unworthy making base accusations and spreading false rumors about his son. Some began to see Daemon as Aegon's rightful heir, though he was only a legitimized bastard. Aegor Rivers, another bastard son of Aegon the Unworthy, urged his brother to rebel and take the crown. And thus, the first Blackfire Rebellion began. Daemon's sigil was a black dragon upon a red field. The realm was nearly riven in two as some supported the red dragon while others supported the black. Daemon's rebellion ended in death and defeat upon the red grass field. Daemon and several of his sons were killed in a volley of arrows. His surviving heirs and supporters fled across the narrow sea in disgrace. This was not the end of House Blackfire, however. Time and again, Blackfire heirs have attempted to invade Westeros and to take the Iron Throne. This small rebel house presented the greatest threat the Targaryens had ever known. That is, until Robert Baratheon raised his warhammer to avenge his lady love. There have been five Blackfire rebellions in total. The last attempt was made in the year 260 during the War of the Nine Penny Kings. Malus Blackfire, also known as Malus the Monstrous, was a terrifying figure. He was born with a grotesquely huge torso and arms. He was also born with a parasitic twin. A second head, no bigger than a fist, protruded from his neck. Some believed Mela swallowed his twin in the womb, which earned him the title of Kinslayer. It was said he killed a horse with a single blow to the skull. Then in turn, he killed his own cousin, twisting the man's head until it ripped free from his shoulders. During the War of the Nine Penny Kings, Sir Barristan Selmy cut a bloody path through the ranks of the Golden Company to slay Malus, thus ending the male line of House Blackfire. We are told in A Dance with Dragons that the female line of House Blackfire still exists, so the reader is led to believe that the name Blackfire died with Malus upon the Stepstones. But death isn't the only way that a bloodline can come to an end. Which brings us back to Lord Varys. We are told when Varys was young, he was castrated and his private parts burned as part of some sort of arcane art. We've seen a similar blood magic ritual before, when Melisandre burned three leeches engorged with king's blood to cast a spell. There is power in king's blood, Melisandre believes. Other magic users may hold the superstition as well. Which is why the mysterious man chose Lord Varys for his spell. It's because Lord Varys is a Blackfire. Sir Barristan Selmy once told Lord Stannis Baratheon that the rotten King Aerys' rule began with Varys, which means upon arriving at court to fulfill his new position, Varys did everything he could to bring the Targaryens to ruin. Aerys had always been prone to paranoia. Varys, with all of his grim tidings and his wriggling worm tongue, finally pushed Aerys over the edge. Varys being a Blackfire provides a motive for his insidious actions. He has been working towards revenge, doing what Arya Stark would do for House Lannister if given the chance. Vengeance as a negative is one of this series' major themes. We have seen several characters consumed and doomed by their thirst for vengeance. In the circle of power in King's Landing, Varys and Littlefinger might just be the two biggest influencers in the game. Littlefinger's motives are also rooted in revenge. Before he was a simpleton for Sansa, he was leering after her lady mother. But Brandon Stark, who is literally an alpha wolf stereotype, beat and embarrassed the callow boy. Littlefinger has harbored hatred ever since. While Littlefinger has climbed the ladder of chaos to get back at all the rich and popular kids that made him feel inferior, Varys has darker motives. He wants revenge for the destruction of his family and the horrible life he had to lead because of it. Varys being the scion of a rival to House Targaryen also gives more credence to the theory that Young Griff is not Aegon Targaryen because if Varys was a Blackfire, then he would have no interest in Targaryen restoration. He would not seek to restore the house he helped to destroy. He would keep their name in their castle, but their bloodline must come to an end. The boy called Young Griff is not Aegon, son of Rhaegar. Well, his first name may be Aegon, but his real surname might just be Mopatis. In A Dance with Dragons, Illyrio tells Tyrion of his second wife, a woman named Sarah. He met her in Lys where she was a slave in service at a pillow house. This is the same free city where Varys is said to be from. 
Sarah was described as beautiful with blue eyes and silver gold hair, features familiar to those of Illyrian descent. Illyria was so in love with her, he purchased her and brought her to Pentos to be his wife. Their marriage was tragically cut short as Sarah died due to the Grey Plague, a horrible disease that turns its victims into stone. All that remains of her is a locket that contains her image, her stone hands which Illyrio keeps in his manse, and the child they made together. Varys and Illyrio would have needed a child to fit their grand scheme, one with the appropriate Valerian features. Instead of searching all the free cities for such a child, they need not look further than Illyrio's own manse. While aboard the Shy Maid, Tyrion finds, quote, one of Illyrio's chests have been packed with a child's clothing, musty but well made. The chest comes from the many supplies Illyrio sent with Tyrion on his journey to join Griff and his crew, which means a child lived at Illyrio's manse at some point in the past. These are not newly bought items. These clothes belong to Illyrio and Sarah's son and heir. Sarah is perhaps Varys's sister or a close relative with the surname Blackfire. They don't have to be brother and sister for the theory to work, just close kin. Supporting Varys' scheme to put the boy called Aegon on the Iron Throne would explain those depths of affection Illyrio mentioned to Tyrion. It's a fascinating theory, one that you can consider the dark version of R plus L equals J. Typically, the hidden heir emerges to reclaim their father's throne and set the realm to rights. They are an honest monarch, one that rules wisely and justly. Varys has brought nothing but rot and ruin to Westeros since he has arrived, and now he plans to sit his pretender upon a throne of lies. One drawback is that there is no strong evidence that supports any of this. Sure, there is the lies and arbor gold theory, the clanking dragon theory, the theory about Rhaegar's rubies, predictions of false dragons and mummers dragons, but all of these feel circumstantial at best. Even with a theory like R plus L equals J, there are strong facts to back it up. If you ignore every aspect of that theory, you can't deny one thing. Either Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark consensually ran away together, or he kidnapped her by force. Roughly nine months later, Lyanna is dead in her bed of blood and Ned returns to Winterfell with a baby. At best, we can create a timeline to see if the Blackfire theory may be possible. Luckily, George R. R. Martin himself gave an interview where he may have offered up just enough information for us to sketch a rough outline of the life of Lord Varys. Here is the quote from the interview. Well, Varys says the fire speaks back when he's telling the story, which is then being retold, and it's 30 years later. Um, you know, you might tell a story something happened to you 20 years ago, and then if I looked at the time machine, would it be exactly what you remember, or...? It's been 30 years since Varys allegedly heard the voice in the flames. Now this can be an arbitrary number Martin threw out for the purposes of discussion, but I've noticed in these past years he has been less tight-lipped about spoilers. He has confirmed Euron has gone to Valyria. He's told us about the hold the door moment and how Stannis will burn his daughter, how Jon is a fire white, how the Song of Ice and Fire is about the Others and Daenerys. This interview could be another moment of Martin openly sharing a detail he has yet to reveal in the books. It is currently the year 300 in Westeros. If the night Varys heard the voice happen 30 years ago, that would place the event in the year 270. He would have been prepubescent at the time, making him about 12 years old or younger, which means he would have been born near the year 258. This would make Varys around 40 years old at the start of the story. Let's use Martin's quote and the dates we've established to build a rough timeline of the life and lives of Lord Varys. Between the years 257 and 259, Varys is born. Determining his parentage is difficult. With each successive rebellion, we learn little and less about the members of House Blackfire. We don't know who Hagon Blackfire married, nor do we know exactly how many sons he had besides Daemon. Then there's an entire generation of Blackfires that we know nothing about. He may well be the son of Malus the Monstrous or some other Blackfire heir we have yet to hear of. As mentioned before, Sarah is a Blackfire relative. Being his sister is possible, but not necessary for the theory to work. The Year 260, the War of the Nine Penny Kings, also known as the Fifth Blackfire Rebellion, begins and ends. Malus is killed by Sir Barristan Selmy. This is likely why Varys arranged for Barristan to be ousted from the Kingsguard. It was a petty act of revenge. This is also why Barristan is sent to Daenerys and not to Young Griff. 
Barristan has a legendary reputation which would lend legitimacy to young Griff's claim. Yet Varys holds resentment towards Barristan for slaying his relative and he wants nothing to do with Targaryen accomplices. Barristan is also too honorable of a man to fit in with the cast of characters Varys has in mind for his grand mummer's farce. The year 266. The Band of Nine collapses. Following the failed rebellion, the remaining members had no interest in Westeros, so they would have no interest in the remaining Blackfire heirs. They were Blackfires and Malus' failed rebellion doomed the Band of Nine's entire mission. Remember, Westeros was just the first of many places they wanted to conquer. As for the Blackfire heirs, I believe that this is the first time after a failed rebellion there are no adults, only children. The Blackfire heirs were separated and sold, Varys to a mummer's troop, Sarah to a pillow house and lice. Graz Dan Moeros threatens Daenerys with a similar fate when she marches her unsullied to Yunkai. Quote, There are pleasure houses in Lys and Tyrosh where men would pay handsomely to bed the last Targaryen. This may be a hint at the fate of the last female Blackfire. Varys would be around 10 years old at the time the same age as Arya was when she began her journey in A Game of Thrones. The years 266 through 269, Varys travels the free cities with the Mummer's troop. He learns their ways which will become useful later in his life. Through Arya, we can see what Varys may have experienced during this troubling time of his youth. How his heart hardened with hatred after what his family was put through. The year 269, Varys is sold by his master to a mysterious man. This may be the biggest hint that Varys has royal blood, because why else would a mage spend so much money to purchase him from a master mummer when young slaves can be bought elsewhere? And without getting too grimdark, I'm sure there are other ways he could have acquired a child for free. Like Brown Ben Plum spotting Tyrion at the slave auction, this unknown mage knew who Varys was and was determined to buy him. The identity of this man could potentially be Marwyn the Mage, a master of the Citadel. He is known for studying magic, including the darker aspects. He has traveled across much of the known world, including a shine by the shadow. It is even said he makes sacrifices to the gods. Such a man like Marwyn would know the saying that there is power in king's blood. As a maester, he may be curious to keep track of the history of Westerosi nobles, even those like the Blackfire Pretenders. Perhaps he tracked the boy down and cut him to ensure that Westeros would never be plagued by another Blackfire Rebellion. It is suspected that the maesters have conspired against the blood of the dragon before. Killing the boy would not be necessary so long as he was made to be ineffectual. I assume Marwyn is in his late 50s, early 60s when we first meet him in Feast. If true, he would be in his late 20s in the year 269. Old enough to have traveled extensively and to have experimented in magic. The years 267 through 278, Varys continues to wander the free cities. Eventually he befriends Illyrio and the two rise in power. Illyrio tells Tyrion that during this time Varys was homeless, sleeping in sewers at night and prowling the rooftops by day. Illyrio goes on to say that he was nearly as poor, wearing soiled silks and living by his blade. But if Illyrio was so poor, how could he afford a marble statue carved in his image when he was only 16 years old. Quote, Varys came from Mir. <laughs> so he did. I, I met him not long after he arrived, one step ahead of the slavers. By day he slept in the sewers, by night he prowled the rooftops like a cat. I was near as poor, a bravo in soiled silks living by my blade. Perhaps you chanced to glimpse the statue by the pool? Pytho Malanon carved that when I was six and ten, a lovely thing, though now I weep to see it. Illyrio had to have considerable money to afford such a lavish likeness. Martin confirmed this in an interview from 2002. He says, quote, As for Illyrio, he was wealthy but not near as powerful as he is today. Only with the help of Varys did he reach a position where the daughter of a magister was willing to marry him. One of Illyrio's flaws as a player in the Game of Thrones is that he is simply not adept at telling lies on the fly. He may be able to outsmart someone with the wits like Viserys Targaryen, but others like Daenerys and Tyrion can see right through him. Illyrio wants Tyrion to believe that he started from the bottom, but that's not true. Varys is a misfit, which makes him good at spotting other misfits. This is how he found all the members aboard the Shy Maid. Illyrio says he doesn't know why Varys chose him to be his protector, but it's likely that Illyrio is just another misfit. Varys saw that Illyrio came from a wealthy family, but that wealth was on the decline. 
So Varys helped him grow wealthy again. Illyrio Mopatis and Coriolanus Snow had that in common, and no, Coriolanus Snow is not a northern bastard. With this new wealth and influence, Illyrio marries the sister of the Prince of Pentos, but then she dies. Varys himself would now have the resources necessary to find his missing relative. This is how Illyrio meets Sarah. The Prince of Pentos might see this as a step down, but if you think about it, if Sarah is a Blackfire, then Illyrio is simply marrying the relative of another royal. This time, he's not just marrying the sister of a prince, but an actual princess. The year 278, Varys is invited to King's Landing. He would be around 20 years old at the time, of a similar age as John Connington, which ties into what was said about King Aerys wanting youth and vigor on his council. The year 283, the Grey Plague hits Pentos. What's strange is that this would be a major event in Pentoshi history, but we are not given an exact year that it happened. Why would Martin not tell us the year? Sarah dies due to the Grey Plague, but not before giving birth to a son. The boy would grow up to be called Young Griff. This is also the year of the fall of House Targaryen. The years 288 through the year 300. Sarah and Illyrio's son is given over to John Connington to be raised in a controlled environment to produce the ideal king. The year 300. The 300th year since Aegon's conquest in the present of the story, Varys would be in his early 40s, young Griff around 17 years old, or near enough it makes no matter. It seems to all fit, if I did my maths accordingly. Here's something to consider. Martin said Illyrio grew incredibly wealthy with Lord Varys' help. He has grown so wealthy that he is able to give away three dragon's eggs to Daenerys as a bridal gift. Illyrio expected Daenerys to die upon the Dothraki Sea, which means he never expected to see those dragon's eggs again. If Daenerys had sold those eggs for money, she could have been rich for the rest of her life. And Illyrio is so rich that he can just give them away without a second thought. Illyrio in Pentos is richer than the crown of Westeros. You would have to wonder then why Varys would accept the role of Spymaster in King's Landing when working with Illyrio was much more lucrative and more illustrious. His position in Pentos seemed more secure than in the Red Keep where he is loathed by nearly everyone around him. Varys must have an ulterior motive for going to Westeros. Considering Aerys heard of Varys' skills and requested him specifically, it leads one to wonder if Varys had his own agents whispering his name into the Mad King's ear. Unlike other Blackfire pretenders before him, Varys didn't seek to lead the Golden Company into another failed rebellion. As a eunuch, he knew no one would follow him into war. He would have to devise a different path to the Iron Throne. Power resides where men believe it resides, no more, no less. In learning this lesson, Varys realized if one desired to take the seat of the Targaryens, one would have to become a Targaryen. Lord Varys has played a deeper game than anyone could have ever known. Even Illyrio is unlikely to know all the threats in the spider's vast web. John Connington, a character who has a major part in Varys' design, is definitely in the dark about the true identity of young Griff. Connington wants to avenge Rhaegar's memory, to atone for losing the Battle of the Bells. He would not take part in a plan that included some feigned boy pretending to be the son of his beloved Rhaegar. But he is so desperate for a second chance that he is now susceptible to the lies of Lord Varys. Before I close this video, I want to share with you another bit of real history. The story of the Chinese eunuch Zhao Gao. Zhao Gao was an official in the Qin Dynasty. He served as a counselor during the reigns of three emperors. During the reign of the second emperor, Zhao had brought a deer into the throne room to be presented to the court. Zhao called the deer a horse, but the emperor, laughing, said it was a deer. Zhao then turned to all of his fellow counselors and posed the question, was the animal a deer or was it a horse? Those who called the animal a horse were spared. Those who called the animal for what it was, a deer, were brutally murdered. Through careful cunning, Zhao Gao had many of the ruling Chen family eliminated in similar gruesome fashion, until the third emperor, aware of Zhao's treacherous nature, had him executed to stop his reign of lies. It is believed that Zhao Gao was a surviving member of the Zhao state, 
which the Qin Dynasty had previously destroyed, and Zhao's actions were all out of revenge. So duplicitous was he that Zhao Gao convinced the kingdom that a deer was a horse. Anyone that did not believe the lie was disloyal and would have to die. Perhaps Zhao Gao is the inspiration for Lord Varys, the infamous eunuch and royal counselor in Westeros who is trying to convince the realm that a black dragon is a red one, and to finalize his revenge for the fall of House Blackfire. Conclusion in the first video, I posed three questions. Where, who, and why is Lord Varys? I did my best to answer the who and why, but I forgot to cover the where, as in where was Lord Varys hiding between books three and five? I think it's quite obvious that he never left King's Landing. Varys is not only a master of whisperers, but a master of disguise. We are told that Arya and Sir Barristan managed to hide in Flea Bottom for days undetected when they were sought out by the Lannisters. If those two could manage, no doubt Varys could as well. It makes sense Varys would remain close while plotting and scheming his revenge. In A Storm of Swords, the cell sword Mero fights in service of Yunkai. When Daenerys' forces win, Mero disappears. Sir Jorah attempts to have his men locate the Titan's bastard, but they are unsuccessful. Miro reappears later having hidden amongst Danny's freedmen. He is unrecognizable because he has shaved his head to hide his identity. Speaking of shaved heads, I wonder, does Varys shave his head not only because that makes it easier for him to put on his mummer's wigs, but also because it hides his Valyrian silver gold hair. We know that Varys does not have purple eyes like a Valyrian, but he does often dress in robes the color of lilac, and he sometimes covers himself in lavender perfume. Varys' name even sounds Targaryen like Viserys and Aerys. His name even looks awfully a lot like Arya's name. When it was noticed that Tyrion was freed from his cell, Varys knew that he would be immediately suspected as a culprit in his escape, and he was right. Tywin Lannister accuses Varys of freeing Tyrion in the moment before his death, and it does not take long for Cersei to notice Varys is missing when she and many others are gathered before her father's body. Cersei would have sent guards to Varys' apartments, but of course, he's already gone. We do get a glimpse of Varys' personal quarters in Book 3 when Tyrion pays him a visit. Quote, The eunuch's apartments were sparse and small, three snug windowless chambers underneath the north wall. I'd hope to discover bushel baskets of juicy secrets to while away the waiting, but there's not a paper to be found. He'd searched for hidden passages too, knowing the spider must have ways of coming and going unseen, but those proved to be equally elusive. There was water in your flagon, gods have mercy, he went on. Your sleeping cell is no wider than a coffin, and that bed, is it actually made of stone or does it only feel that way? Varys closed the door and barred it. I am plagued by backaches, my lord, and prefer to sleep upon a hard surface. I would have taken you for a feather bed man. I am full of surprises. End quote. Varys has many, many enemies, no doubt. If someone wanted to cause him harm, the best time and place to do that would be when he is asleep in his own private quarters. But Varys has chosen a living space that makes such attempts all but impossible. A windowless room means no one can sneak in. Plain water in the flagon makes it harder to place in poisons. And then there are Varys's little birds. I'm certain they are constantly watching and notifying him of any potential threats. Yes, in A Feast for Crows, Jaime Lannister does waylay Varys in his apartments, and it seems that Varys is taken by surprise. But Varys knew he was there. Do not doubt it for one second. Quote, At the sound of footsteps, he stood beside the door. Varys entered in a wash of powder and lavender. Jamie stepped out behind him, kicked him in the back of the knee, knelt on his chest, and shoved the knife up under his soft white chin, forcing his head up. Why, Lord Varys, he said pleasantly, fancy meeting you here. Sir Jamie, Varys panted. 
you frighted me, end quote. Much like Melisandre and her fires, danger to his own person is what Varys checks for first. Quote, I was thinking you might help me pluck my brother from his cell before Sir Illyn lops his head off. It is an ugly head, I grant you, but he only has the one. Yes, well, if, if you would, remove the blade. Yes, gently, as it please, my lord, gently. Ooh, I am pricked. The eunuch touched his cheek and gaped at the blood on his fingers. I have always abhorred the sight of my own blood. You'll have more to abhor shortly, unless you help me. Varys struggled to a sitting position. Your brother, if the imp should vanish unaccountably from his cell, questions would be asked. I would f fear for my life." End quote. Varys is unsettled by the sight of his own blood, but when it comes to the blood of others, he's not squeamish at all. Be sure that Varys has already weighed his options and he has decided saving Tyrion was too perfect of an opportunity to pass up, even if that means he would have to go into hiding. Varys must have been sure that securing Tyrion would have pushed him closer to his endgame. So Varys never left King's Landing. He may have never even left the castle. I wonder if Varys' claim of having a backache is because the stone bed he claims to sleep on actually leads to a secret chamber where he can sleep safely and peacefully on a softer surface. Or perhaps his back hurts from the weight of carrying such an amazing story. Another thing we can be sure of is that Varys has maintained control of his little birds this whole time. When Kyburn is appointed spymaster, Cersei believes that the informants and little birds are now under his command. That is not the case. Quote, Varys had us all believing he was irreplaceable. What fools we were. Once the queen let it become known that Kyburn had taken the eunuch's place, the usual vermin had wasted no time in making themselves known to him to trade their whispers for a few coins. It was the silver all along, not the spider. Kyburn will serve us just as well. End quote. Leave it to Cersei to misread the situation. No doubt Varys has instructed his little birds to pretend they are loyal to Kyburn. Meanwhile, they don't do anything without receiving Lord Varys' permission first. Any information they discover goes to him, and he sorts out what he wants them to tell Kyburn so that Kyburn can tell Cersei. I want to discuss in more depth the popular theory for why Varys made his confession. The theory that says Varys wanted his little birds to overhear what he was saying so they could spread the message to others. Let's be clear here. Varys does not need to manipulate his followers no more than he already has. The little birds are utterly dependent and adherent to Varys. He does not need to trick them to do his bidding. Also, there are no others listening. That would be entirely too risky and serves no benefit. Now, I would like to discuss Lord Varys' hatred of magic and the voice in the flames. Varys develops this hatred after he is mutilated by the unknown mage. As Martin hinted in the interview clip I shared, we should question if Varys heard a voice or not. Martin basically tells us that Varys was mistaken. There was no voice in the flames. Varys was more than likely hallucinating because of the drugs and the pain. I bring this up because some believe Varys hating magic means that he and Daenerys will not get along. Daenerys hatched her dragons with magic and her dragons are creatures of magic. A lot of Danny's story is heavy with magical elements. This all may be true, but Varys was working against Daenerys before she improvised her spell. If my theory holds true, he's been working against her family since before she was born. So yes, they will be enemies. They've always been enemies but for other reasons. I would not even classify Daenerys as a practitioner of magic. She used a spell one time and has many magical encounters, but she is no witch or magi. If Daenerys's Valerian blood is a problem, young Griff shares that same blood. 
He may or may not be a Targaryen, but he is definitely Valyrian. But the overall point I want to make here is that Varys and Daenerys have many reasons to be enemies. Use of magic would not even be in the top three. Now to move on to the Blackfire theory, one of the most intriguing theories in this series. Some evidence to support young Griff being a fake I forgot to include are the names John Connington and Griff. If you shorten his name, you get John Con, as in con artist. A con artist is a person who cheats or tricks others by persuading them to believe something that is not true. Griff also sounds a lot like the word grift, which means a petty or small scale swindle. Swindle is another word for fraud, trick, or deception. I don't think John Connington is aware that young Griff is a false dragon, but I do think Martin is using these names to plant clues for the reader. We've seen him have this sort of fun with names before. Rickon Stark names his dire wolf Shaggy Dog. A shaggy dog is a type of storytelling technique. It is defined as an extremely long winded anecdote characterized by extensive narration of typically irrelevant incidents and terminated by anticlimax, which might mean Rick and Stark might not matter all that much in the end, no matter how hard he zigzags. To finish, what is Lord Varys' stage show, his grand mummer's farce? In the secret passageways in the Red Keep, we overhear part of the outline to his show when Arya spies on a conversation between Illyrio and Varys. Let's take a brief moment to focus on that. Illyrio was not only in Westeros, but in King's Landing, visiting places within the Red Keep that many Targaryens may have never seen. Water dancing through the halls Viserys considered home, a place Daenerys has never been and can only dream of. It's a bizarre chapter to reread now that we know what we know. Illyrio wants Varys to delay the impending Stark-Lannister civil war. Varys bemoans that more delays may not be possible. The tensions between the two houses are too high and there are other factors as well. Littlefinger, Renly, Stannis, Lysa Aaron. This may no longer be a game for two players. The Dothraki Targaryen invasion must needs happen soon. But how is this all supposed to play out? Here is the story as I see it in Lord Varys' designs. Act 1. Westeros is at peace for over 10 years, but now a grand civil war has begun. House Stark and House Lannister fight for supremacy. Act 2. The Dothraki invade led by the infamous Khal Drogo, supporting the claims of Prince Viserys Targaryen, the son of the Mad King. Prince Viserys wants his father's throne and revenge against all those that rebelled against his family. Act 3. The civil war is set aside so the houses of Westeros can unite against the Dothraki and put down this Targaryen pretender. But because of that civil war, the noble armies are weak and it seems that vile, savage Dothraki horde will win and put this mad Targaryen prince on the throne. Act 4. Just when all hope seems lost, a hero emerges. Prince Aegon Targaryen, son of the beloved Rhaegar, returns. He never died, instead he was safely taken away from the castle and replaced with another. Now he leads the Golden Company to fight the Dothraki and save the day. The Golden Company are not remembered as rebels that supported the Blackfires. No, they are but heroic Westerosi exiles who have come to save their homeland. Their ancestors would be proud. At least that's what the singers will say. The barbarian Khal Drogo is destroyed. His Khaleesi, Daenerys, who is the daughter of the Mad King as well, never forget, is killed too. No doubt she would have schemed to put her foreign-born son on the throne if she lived. Mad Prince Viserys is killed as well. The rightful heir sits the throne. Targaryen restoration has been achieved. Or has it? Well, that was the initial plan. 
many things have changed dramatically as they tend to do in the Game of Thrones. Viserys died, Khal Drogo died, many Starks and Lannisters have died. As for Daenerys, she birthed dragons. Her dragons have changed the game in a big way. Those dragons might be why when the curtain closes on Varys' stage show, they won't be curtains of velvet cloth, but curtains of fire. And that's it. That's the life and lies of Lord Varys, the complete theory. In an ironic twist, we learn Lord Varys is actually a huge dick. Thank you all for watching. I hope you all enjoyed. Now it's time to call the banners. Please like, subscribe, and be sure to leave a comment down below. Don't forget to ring the bell and turn on those notifications. Again, thank you all for watching, and I will see you all for the next one.